What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Action Network podcast. Brendan Glasheen with our UFC crew to preview UFC 275 in Singapore. We've got 11 fights to get to. Uh, we won't get to all fights, but we'll get to some of the you know the keys uh, of the weekend. We've got the main event, co-main, dogs, props, fight of the night, uh, Sean and Billy's fight of the night, prop bet, uh, each of the guys like best bets and also we'll have a dfs outlook from billy billy ward uh former professional mma fighter also one of our best mma analysts at the action network sean zarillo also uh, a senior writer covers uh the fighting side for us as well looking forward to it good to be back on the pod uh talking ufc we've got a great uh main event here we've got glover Teixeira and yuri prohashka prohashka is the favorite um zarillo what's the read here on the fight of the night what do you got or the uh, main event, I should say. I love the unders here. And I don't view it so dissimilarly from what was my other biggest bet of the year on the unders in the Gaethje Oliveira fight. In that matchup and in this matchup, you have two fighters who were glass cannons. Offensive dynamos with big holes and liabilities on the defensive end. Yuri's striking, volume, output, speed, reach, all advantages for him here. But he's been hurt in both of his UFC fights. He's been hurt consistently regionally, knocked out four times, I believe, in his career. Not in a while, but hurt badly in both of his UFC fights. Actually went out for a minute and then recovered against Dom Reyes, got mounted in that fight. If Glover gets on top of Yuri, it could be an instant sub. I think there's major holes in Yuri's grappling game. His takedown defense is pretty subpar. You can get him to the ground. And if Glover mounts him like Dom did, I don't think Yuri's getting back up. That said, Glover also gets hurt in every fight. And both of these guys tend to recover pretty quickly and end up rallying. And that's why they're both on winning streaks because they've rallied back to victory. But they're both very able to be hurt, both very open on the defensive end. Yuri's kind of wild. He'll leave himself open for takedowns, but Glover's there to be hit. And with the speed advantage that Yuri has, I think he's probably going to catch him multiple times early. The question is whether Glover can withstand those and maybe get into a clinch, get the takedown, and go from there. So the under one and a half could hit, certainly. I paid juice on the unders. I bet the under two and a half at minus 170, the under three and a half at minus 280, and then even the under four and a half at minus 400. This fight to end inside the distance was listed as high as minus 700 on some of these books. It's come down a little bit, but even that minus 400 for the under four and a half, I think is actually five, seven percent edge. I projected this around 88% to end inside the distance. I do not see it going the full 25 minutes. I have a lot of money on these unders. Um, but in terms of money line side, a value side between the two fighters, I think Glover is probably the side from a money line perspective. That said, I prefer his inside the distance props. Inside the distance at plus 250 for Glover, projected that closer to plus 200. And his submission prop, you can get around plus 380 at FanDuel, I believe. I projected that around plus 280. So Glover and the unders, Glover inside the distance and the unders, that's how I'm attacking this fight. But just pure violence, very binary but I expect somebody to get finished and probably relatively quickly. Billy, you're struggling to come around on a, on a side here or what, what's, how are you compartmentalizing to make a pick? Yeah, this isn't one where I see, you know, either side is necessarily having a good value from a straight up money line standpoint. If I had to put a straight up bet on this one, I like Yuri inside the distance. That's only minus 150. So we're just getting a little better price on that than on some of the unders and stuff like that. But I'm with Sean. I see this fight going out exactly the way he did. Honestly, my favorite, bet if you will of this is the prize picks line you can get glover under one and a half takedowns that's what they've got it set right now and sean laid out exactly why i think that's a good bet i don't think Geary gets back up if he does get taken down and into a bad position so there's just a lot of ways that once go right in terms of Geary getting a quick knockout or once glover gets on top of him then it looks like you know a submission is probably pretty eminent but uh yeah you know this is one i'm very interested in and for DraftKings and daily fantasy stuff, just because as Sean laid out, it's super likely to end inside the distance, but not one that I'm really very confident in any individual bets on. Okay, let's move on then to the uh, co-main event. We've got Valentina Shevchenko and Tyla Santos. Santos, the uh, significant dog at plus 425. Shevchenko is at minus 650. Um, But of course, you know, we don't really see much uh, value there in Shevchenko. So, We'll go to Billy first here. Billy, what's the, how can you bet this fight if you got a read on it? 
Yeah, you know, Shevchenko is quite arguably the best female fighter we've ever seen inside the UFC. Her only two losses in the UFC are to Amanda Nunes, up a weight class. And she's looking to make a seventh consecutive title run or title defense in this run right now against Tyler Santos. So, you know, that explains the lines that we're seeing in the stuff like and how wide it is right now. She's a former high level boxing and kickboxing fighter, but she hasn't really finished anyone on the feet as of late. You know, most of her stoppages lately have been ground and pound, elbows for mount, crucifix, stuff like that. And that's why I'm starting to see a little bit of an angle on Santos here. Santos started out as a Muay Thai fighter. Santos has three knockdowns in her five-fight UFC career. Shevchenko has one in, I think, 13 fights. So, you know, we've seen a lot of WMMA fights where there's been big upsets. You know, Rousey lost to Holmes, Amanda Nunes losing to Pena recently. And I, I'm starting to feel like this might be another one where we're seeing a plus 450 fighter who I think has at least a reasonable power edge here. She looks like the bigger, stronger fighter. And she could also kind of just bully Shevchenko up against the cage. So it's really more based on a like a gut feeling and a, all title reigns have to come to an end at some point. But I actually like Santos's money line at plus 450 in this one. All right, looking at the co-main Zerillo, the women's flyweight belt. What do you have for us? Yeah, so I, I see... The path for Santos, as Billy mentioned, if she can bully her, maybe get a couple takedowns. Uh, Jennifer Mai, I believe, the only person to take a round off of Valentina, aside from Amanda Nunes, and that was with the takedown and holding her down on the ground. Can Santos do it three times? I'm not sure. She's never been five rounds before, so that's a major question mark. Her level of competition is actually pretty questionable. I think her best win in terms of wins that have aged well is maybe Molly McCann, who's two and one since they fought. Her other three opponents that she's beaten in the UFC are one and four, and two of them have retired. And that win was over Priscilla Cachuera, who's one of the lesser fighters in WMMA in the UFC. So I could see Santos maybe winning one of the first three rounds. I would probably look to jumping live on Shevchenko if her price drops from where it is currently, uh, currently maybe to minus 300 if it has something like that. If it's 1-1 one, one after two, that would be an angle I'd look to take. If I'm playing the Santos side, the one place I did project value on this fight is Santos by decision. You can get value on that at plus 1,200. I projected it closer to plus 1,000. So maybe a very small, small stab, like a tenth of a unit stab on Santos by decision if you want a pre-fight bet. But probably the way I'll look to play it is to take Shevchenko at a better price if she drops one of the first two rounds. Let's talk some dogs now. UFC 275 again in Singapore at the Singapore Indoor Stadium. Looking at dogs and uh, Zarillo, I'll go to you first here. You got something for us coming up as well in the uh, fight of the night. That's coming next, but uh, you're going to go with some plus money here. Uh, some good plus money for a dog. Yeah, I'm going to take a total that's an underdog. The un- over two and a half rounds between Mahashete and Steve Garcia. You can get that at plus 140. It goes to decision line is plus 180. So this is a lightweight fight. Lightweight fights go to decision around 48% of the time. Finish rate at lightweight is 52%. This bout is lined closer to 65% to end inside the distance. So I just think it's gone a little bit too far. I don't see either fighter as a particularly potent finisher. Steve Garcia, of the two, may be the one who's less durable. He's come up in weight, got hurt in his last fight against Charlie Ontiveros, who's a very low-level fighter. Not sure he's as durable at 155 as he was at 145. That said, I don't really see either guy as a potent finisher. I would expect this fight to go to a decision around the average for lightweight, and you're getting close to a 7 to 10% edge there relative to your average lightweight fight. So fight to go to the distance, plus 180, and then I'll have more on the over 2.5 at plus 140. Billy, favorite dog? Yeah, I'm going a little bit longer odds with this one that I'm super comfortable with, but Jacob Malkoon is all the way up to plus 250 on DraftKings. And he's fighting Brendan Allen, who, one, hasn't super impressed me lately, but Allen is mostly a submission guy who doesn't really have great takedown defense. We saw Malkoon in his last fight attempt like 11 or 12 takedowns, just kind of relentlessly pursue it. So it really feels like a fairly clear path to a Malkoon victory here. He just needs to continue to get those takedowns, do enough damage on the ground, and stay out of the submissions. I don't think we've really seen Malkoon fight any high-level submission type fighters, at least not in the UFC. So it's a bit of a question mark in terms of whether he's going to be able to avoid that from Allen. But I do think at plus 250 with such a clear path, that's a pretty good value. Okay, very good. Moving on to the fight of the night. And you got to go back to 2020, early 2020, arguably the fight of the year, a rematch between Yoana Yadrachek and Jung Wei Lee. Uh, Wei Lee at minus 175. 
at Gray Track at plus uh, 145. This is the first time we're going to see uh, yeah, Drachek since that fight uh, in early 2020. So it's been a while. Uh, Zarilla, we'll start with you. How do you go about uh, handicapping this one? Yeah, going from a five-round war to a three-round fight, maybe we get a more tepid pace. I think Johanna's biggest issue in that fight is that she went to war, and she doesn't have as much power as Whaley. She's more technical. She's faster, better defensively. And if she makes this a more technical fight, I don't see how it's not a 50-50 fight. Wiley with the power, the way Joanna's head swelled up, the optics for the judges, I think that's ultimately why she won it. I think most people would actually agree that Joanna has the better cardio in five rounds as opposed to three rounds would probably help her. But in the first fight, if it ended after three, she would have won a split decision. So I think that fact is interesting. The margins in these rounds were so close. I think Wiley won the fight. She probably had an argument for winning 49-46, where Joanna would have had to edge out a 48-47 split. And if you look at the media scorecards, that's generally where the consensus opinion was. A bunch had it 49-46 for Wiley. A few had it for Joanna, 3-2. to two. But Joanna just wore the damage really badly. And if she's a bit more technical this time, doesn't try to go to war, uses her speed advantage, stays on the outside with her footwork, I think she can certainly win a decision here. The margins are going to be very thin for scoring these rounds. I mentioned the power optics definitely swing towards Wiley, but if she can't get on the inside of Joanna, she can't get takedowns here, and she has the grappling upside, Wiley does, but I don't see her getting takedowns at high volume or keeping Joanna down for long. So if it's not a war this time, it's basically a coin flip. I would have been happy to take either fighter plus money. It didn't really matter who it was. Uh, So Joanna plus 145 is a bet for me, but I'm also going to take the fight to go to a decision. Minus 200 win. I projected this closer to minus 260. So I have bets both on the fight to go the distance and on Joanna's money line. You could just bet her decision prop as well around plus 200. I see value on that as well. But I'm going to split my wagers, hope for a push at worst, and maybe we cash both of them. All right, Billy, fight of the night. Uh, kind of laid it out for you there, and, and Zarillo did a good job recapping. Uh, how do you go about looking at this fight? Yeah, Sean made a ton of similar points to what I was looking at. Like, I'm really glad he brought up where the scorecards were after three rounds. I think the public consensus is that Joanna has better cardio, so therefore a three-round fight actually shifts it towards Dang. But, you know, she has a team behind her. She's training ATT. I think they're going to recognize that and say, hey, it's only three rounds. You can turn up the volume. You can push the pace a little bit more here. And some of that power and damage optics, maybe those don't look so bad after three rounds. You know, the Hema tomato on her forehead was about a third the size after three rounds as it was by the end of the night. So does that, you know, work in her favor too? The only thing that gives me a little pause is just the two-year layoff. But in those two years, Zhang has been knocked out by Rose Nami Yunus and then lost another fight to Rose Nami Yunus. So it doesn't really look like we're seeing Zhang having improved in that time span, where Joanna very well could have. She could have taken those two years, got with a good team, really plugged up some holes in her game. So I think plus one to 45 is the best you can get on her. And I'm, I'm all over that this one on this one. Excellent. Very good. Let's go to some props. And uh, we, we encourage this, of course, with any bet you make, but shop those lines, especially when it comes to the player props that are available uh, over on the books. What do you got for Sean Zarillo in the prop market for UFC 275? Yeah, one of these fights got canceled. So I only have one favorite prop left. The other would have been Starboy inside the distance. That fight is off. Billy already laid out the case for Jacob Malkoon. Now, I'm not sure if this guy could bust the grape if you put it in front of him. He is very much a decision machine going to try to take you down, hold you down for extended periods. And in terms of how fights are scored now, it's not particularly friendly to the judges because he doesn't do a lot of damage. He just sort of turns himself into a blanket and lays on top of you. But just by the math, Malkoon is very likely to win his bouts by decision. I projected a decision as 60% of his win condition. I actually probably could have put it higher, closer to 70 or 75%. There's some plus 900s out there on Malkoon by decision. And if you just take his money line, you take his decision prop, the market's telling you that he's going to win a decision about 35 to 40% of the time and finish around 60% of the time. That doesn't make any sense to me. It should be double that. So I projected his decision number around plus 500, plus 550. You can get a plus 900 out there. I like that probably all the way down to plus 700 on Malkoon by decision. Not a huge bet for me, about a quarter unit, but... I think tremendous value based on how he fights and how he needs to win his fight. It's just a massive number. All right, Billy, you've worked at the, you've looked at the prop market here and you've done some surfing. What do you have? 
Yeah, I wish I would have looked at the prop market a little harder before I gave out Malcoon straight up. As soon as I saw the email from Sean, I was like, yeah, no, that makes a lot more sense. That's a great line on that one. But uh, I'm looking at, I believe it's the opener between, no, second fight, between Na Liang and Silvana Gomez Suarez. You can get that one at plus 200 to go the distance. And this is a 115-pound female fight. Like, I really just don't understand this line at all. Both women have been finished in all of their UFC fights. Neither of them have a finish, though. So I'm not really sure how exactly, you know, betting markets or sports books think this one's going to end so early. But Silvana Juarez seems to be the better striker. She's got some knockout wins. Naliang has some submission wins. But they've both fought fairly low-level competition. I think the odds are better than not that this one cancels out to an extent when they're fighting at least moderate level competition in each other. We've got the big cage for the pay-per-view event, 115 pound women. This one shouldn't be plus 200 to go the distance. I also really like the over one and a half there as yeah. well. I, you know, maybe there's a late finish here, but you rarely get an over one and a half in a woman's fight, particularly a straw weight fight, particularly a lower level straw weight fight where maybe these girls are finish reliant, but I don't necessarily see it. I again would project this closer to the, the divisional average in terms of the line. Right. UFC 275, uh, significant also from a DFS perspective, Daily Fantasy, because uh, this event uh, actually kickstarts the DraftKings Fantasy Championship. So uh, uh, this week is the first round. Uh, Full disclosure, I'm in Connecticut, so I don't get to pull up the contest. So I I turn this over to Billy, and he gives us his uh, DFS breakdown. What do you have for us, Billy? Yeah, I'm very excited for this one. I qualified for the championship all the way back in December, so it's been a real slow burn. We were never quite sure exactly when they were going to start it off, but I really like the format here. There's 70 qualifiers. The first round of it is basically a cash game because 30 of the 70 get through. So that's where my head's at in terms of DFS this week. I'm really just looking at the best cash plays. And it's an interesting week for cash games because we have two five-round title fights. We have another, assuming, high-action fight between uh, Zhang and Dragic on the main card. And I'm not quite sure that we can just stack all four title fighters on this one. That's baking two losses into your lineup automatically. And then we've seen such ridiculous stoppage odds. You know, Sean laid out the case for Yuri Glover. So that one's pretty interesting. I think you're definitely going to want to just have one of those guys because whoever loses that one probably has almost nothing in terms of score. We also both were on, you know, the Santos-Shevchenko fight to be a little bit closer than the betting lines. So that's where I'm going to look to stack for my cash games. And then again, you know, we talked about young Jake Chick. She's fairly cheap. I think only 7,400, 7,200, something like that. And just given the output and the volume that she could put up over three rounds, that's, you know, my Sean Zarilla special in terms of a female underdog with long stoppage odds who's probably going to at least give you a decent score, even in a losing performance. Uh, beyond that, it's pretty weak at the top end. My favorite, like, 9,000-plus fighter is now off the card in manual cop. So I think Sing Woon Choi has a decent odds – a decent path to putting up a big score. He's really the only thing I like at the top end. Um, in the middle, you know, Sean talked about Steve Garcia. I also really like Jack Dell and Madalena, who we'll get to in a little bit. And then if you're going cheap, we like Jacob Malcoon. You know, Brendan Allen should be able to get up a bunch of times if he gets taken down. Could he rack up seven or eight takedowns, giving himself a good score even in a loss? I think that one's pretty likely. So I'm pretty much staying away from the GPPs this week. You guys are on your own if you're trying to build those tournament lineups, but that's what I'm looking for in terms of the mostly cash game format of the championship round. Very good. Sean, any, anything you want to weigh in on before we uh, go to best bets? It's 11 fights. So yep. you need to be unique. If you are playing GPPs, maybe Santos against Shevchenko is a way to get there. I would expect Shevchenko to be extremely highly owned. Um, but yeah, just try to be different and definitely go contrary in this week. If you're playing tournaments, cause you don't have too many options. And, and Santos can be in even the tournament optimal with a loss here, right? If it goes five rounds and she has good output, gets a takedown or two, some control time against the fence. If we don't see a lot of underdogs put up big scores, that wouldn't shock me at all. So I think she's a much better tournament play than Shevchenko. And I think this is a good card for underdogs. You know, you could definitely take a shot with a lot of these dogs. Maybe you don't even get close to the maximum salary. If you're, right. if you're playing a lineup and you want to be contrarian, just take a bunch of dogs, maybe one favorite and, and go completely contrarian here. And Billy, of course, we wish you luck. I mean, thank uh, you. We hope to check back in, and you're you're moving on. So yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be tweeting out the link on Saturday night if anyone wants to sweat it out with me, so we can all I'll drive that throughout the night. Nice, love that for you. <laughs> all right, let's go. Let's go to best bets. We will start with Sean Zarillo. 
I already laid out the case for the unders in the main event and of the bunch, the under two and a half at minus 170, I think is the sweet spot. I stayed away from the under one and a half. Maybe there's a tepid pace early, but I don't see this fight going over halfway. Both guys very vulnerable defensively. Either could get knocked out. Glover definitely has a high probability of his submission as well, or a technical knockout on the ground positional TKO. So definitely love the unders in the main event amongst my biggest bets of the year with the unders in the Gaethje Oliveira fight. So the under two and a half at minus 170 is the play. All right. And speaking of uh, dogs and getting some, some plus money, we've done that quite a bit on this uh, episode today on the Action Network podcast, UFC 275. Billy, you've got some plus money for your best bet. Yeah, just slightly here. I'm looking at Jake Matthews at plus 125. He's fighting Andre Fialo. And Fialo, this is his fourth fight already in 2022. You know, Brendan mentioned it earlier. This fight's in Singapore. He's been traveling all over the place. And I think staying busy to an extent is probably a good thing for MMA fighters. But, you know, it's when you're between fights and when you have those long layoffs and training camps is when fighters really get better. I think this is going to start to catch up to Fialo at a certain point. Like four fights in six months is just an insane pace. And it's also a tough matchup. You know, Jake Matthews probably has all the grappling upside here. He's getting about two takedowns for 15 minutes. Fialo is just going to come out and swing and try to put you away early. Fialo doesn't have great striking defense. So I think it's pretty close to a coin flip in terms of the stand-up, although Fialo is the better power. But if Matthews is smart, he's just going to put him on his back, do some damage on the ground, hunt for submissions, which he's done pretty well in the past. So at plus 125, I would have this flight as about a coin flip, or honestly, maybe even Matthews is a slight favorite. So plus 125 is a good value on him. Yeah, Fiala is such a headhunter too. Very one-dimensional. He doesn't throw any kicks. So if Jake is just very smart about game planning, I could definitely see him as the favorite. He's just mentioned that he could. He thinks he could take Fiala out on the feet. I don't know. Jake Matthews is a weird guy. He's a bit noodly, trains with a small gym. Like He makes me nervous, but I would certainly lean Matthews if I was picking a side in that fight. You And you always just hope that that's just fighters talking just to talk. Because, like, you have to say that. Like, I've never – you know, I've had some interviews and stuff where I'm not going to go, oh, well, I'm just going to try to take him down and make this boring. Like, you can't say that ahead of a fight. So, hopefully he's just running his mouth and that's not really the plan. But, you know, if it is, so be it. 